We have a listener. Now, if I know anything about people like you, and trust me, I have a fairly good understanding, you do not know much about life among monsters and under gods. Never fear, dear listener, for I can be your guide through this tumultuous journey into our troublesome world. That is, if you're bold enough to accompany me. You see, if you truly want to know the fates of our beloved heroes, you must brave the murkiest of waters, the darkest of forests, and the sweetest of shops. Does that worry you? It probably should, but if you're still listening, welcome to Roanoke. And here's a vanilla chocolate cherry. Your change is 213 and your receipt's right here. Have a good day and come back to the sweet shop soon. I'm in the middle of a shift at the sweet shop. It's been busy and in the moments between customers, I'm able to look out at the shop. Customers are sitting all over the shop, at tables and the bar, even on window ledges. It's hard to tell what time it is. The sun's so blinding, it looks nearly white outside. And another one. Welcome to the sweet shop. What can I get you? Edith, dear, how are you? I... What? The woman before me is Aunt Linda. I think. She looks enough like her. But that voice... She looks at me, concern etching wrinkles in her skin. Guilt floods through me. I think this is just one of those feelings I get. The type of thinking that gets me in trouble. Alone. The stubbornness to pursue something that does not exist. Here I am, turning it on the woman who took me in despite fully knowing I'm a deserving pariah. Maybe I deserve that. Sorry, Auntie. Just been a long day. What do you need? My sweet tooth's acting up. The doctor prescribed a vanilla sugar cone with sprinkles. You got it. Oh wait, what sprinkles did you want? Rainbow, of course. I knew we were related. I'm so glad you took this job, dear. Everyone in town, it seems, is pulling me aside, complimenting that niece of mine. You've made quite the impression here. I think they're just being polite, Aunt Linda. Nonsense! You've been such a positive influence. Everybody loved your work on the play. Now, this may surprise some people, but I did not return to play rehearsals after that first incident. My breakup with theater was mutual. No way was I going back there, and the director made it clear that I was to stay away from her production or else she might make me disappear. I don't think I ever actually had the heart to tell Aunt Linda I was actually using that time to hang out with the town delinquent. <laughs> yeah, Auntie, I definitely inspired some strong emotions, got some lasting connections. Oh, I'm so happy for you. The play was such a success. Is that my favorite councilwoman? Oh, Virginia, you can't pick favorites. Oh, pardon me, pardon me. Is that Roanoke's favorite councilwoman? And her wonderful niece? Edith, yes. Hello. A wonderful niece and a wonderful new addition to our town. I can barely even remember how we got on without you. She's just been a joy to have this summer. You've made Roanoke your home. I was just telling Virginia the other day about your friends. <laughs> yeah. Um, Mayor Dally, can I take your order? Oh, silly me. I get so distracted sometimes. Good company and all that. Now, on the risk of sounding paranoid, I do know this. Linda Turner and Virginia Dally mix like oil and water. In the public, they make nice. 
the beloved mayor and the town's favorite busybody working together for the community. No one else, however, has been around to hear my aunt's comments after. She can't stand Mayor Daly and her know-it-all streak, her magnanimous attitude. Something something that fake little politico thinks she's better than everyone else because she has the biggest house in town and her daddy was mayor too. Just trust me, it's a whole saga, and this little charade doesn't add up. Mostly because it doesn't seem like a charade. At all. I hadn't realized you two were so close. Oh, Edith, uh, we're girlhood friends. Councilwoman has been my closest confidant for years. Yeah. Well, here's your ice cream. Thank you, dear. It was so nice to see you. Yes, I must be going as well. So much work to be done. You dallies are always up to something. What can I say? We have a very special relationship with Roanoke. <laughs> I ring them both out, my dismay growing as Mayor Daly offers, no, insists, that she pay for Aunt Linda's order. And Aunt Linda barely even puts up a fight for supreme dominance. Just thanks her warmly as a close friend. I watch them leave, more confused than ever. Maybe it's good that Aunt Linda is finally making powerful friends. I doubt it. It has been a slow day. The sweet shop is entirely empty, and it feels as though hours have gone by since I last saw someone. I've cleaned the counter four times already, and I might burn through the metal surface if I go for a fifth. Then he walks in. Jesse Whitestone, the biggest celebrity New England has ever witnessed. His songs were on the radio constantly, his debut album one of the best I had ever heard. Nor was I the only one who thought so. Jesse left school to pursue his career, risking everything to be a star. He's supposed to be working on his next album, and everyone's saying it's going to be even better. There was definitely no reason for him to be here, in Roanoke of all places. Hey, Edith. And there was definitely no reason for him to know my name! Uh, um... Hi? Heard this was the place to be. Oh, yeah, this is, um, <laughs> the place. <laughs> yeah, I'm starting to see why. Oh my god, this isn't happening. This cannot be real. He's looking at me and biting his lip. <gasps> well, can I take your order? Anytime. What do you recommend? <laughs> oh, me? Um... <clears throat> The mint chocolate chip is good, especially with some sprinkles. Sprinkles? Huh? Uh, yeah, yeah, sprinkles are kind of what I'm known for here. <laughs> that and not dealing with customers' bad manners. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Oh my god, he loves that. Jesse Whitestone loves my customer service tactics. Or that I like sprinkles. Or both? <laughs> Have I really met the perfect man? I'll have what you're having then. I'll get right to it. Even though I have so many other orders to do. <laughs> Has anyone told you that you're gorgeous? <laughs> what? <laughs> Me? No. That can't be. Because I think you're gorgeous. <gasps> wow! You... You really think so? Edith Raleigh, the moment I walked into this shop, I knew I had to talk to you. You look like a perfect song. One that is summer warmth and plucked heartstrings. A yearning that goes bone deep, that can be heard from the bottom of a storming sea. I could write thousands of songs trying to capture your beauty, but 
it would evade me every time. Of course, I think so. I know it deep inside of me. <laughs> I have stopped scooping ice cream as I am completely and utterly unable to function. Every piece of knowledge I have ever known has evaporated. I'm sorry. My rambling distracted you. Oh, oh right. The ice cream. My job. Uh, silly me. And here you are. I can't wait. What do I owe you? No, no, no. It's on the house. I, I couldn't. What happened to not putting up with poor manners? It feels rude to not pay. I... Okay. That's... 419. And finally, meeting you was priceless. He held out the money to me, and when I reached for it, he took my hand. <gasps> You'll remember what I said, won't you? You could join me on tour, and we can make beautiful things. We would be unstoppable. <sighs> that sounds amazing, but... What is it? I have school and and my parents then promise me when the time is right we'll find each other again he lets go of my hand pressing his payment into my palm i go to ring him up i'll do my best that makes me so The sweet shop is empty. It seems the whole town has stayed in today. Hard to blame them, with the town covered in fog so thick it's hard to tell where the sky ends and the overcast sky begins. I can't even see the other side of Main Street through it. I could... just leave. They'd never catch me. Edith Rally, gone without a trace. Hmm. Seems too relevant, somehow. Wait, dark shapes have appeared outside the sweet shop windows. I can't make them out from behind the counter. Slowly, I reach for the broom leaning up against the wall beside me, gripping it with two hands. It always pays to be prepared, and having something to defend myself with thaws the freshly frozen ice in my veins a little. Don't do anything stupid, Edith. Come on, just leave it. But when do I ever leave well enough alone? I'm going to do it. I walked across the parlor floor, all of the empty booths and tables now unnerving. I had never noticed how quiet this place was when no one was in it. I had grown so used to it, busy with summertime flair. The floor kept stretching before me, and it took me an unbearable amount of time to get to the window. Pressing my forehead to the glass, squinting, I tried to piece together what was out there. Still, the shapes appeared as shadows in the fog. What could they be? They certainly weren't people. They were much too big. The shapes towered above me, and they were... spiky. The one closest to me almost looked like it had wings. <laughs> oh! Oh no! My blood runs cold. I know what those shapes are now. Manticores. A well has burst inside of me and all I can feel is fear and something like memory. But I don't know where it's coming from. I scramble away from the windows, readying to book it to the back door, when I realize that the manticores aren't moving. Not even that. They are perfectly still. Frozen. I force myself to hold my ground. You cannot understand what is in front of you if you're running away. <laughs> Peering through the windows, I watch. There are very few creatures that don't move, and the manticore is not one of them. So I wait. For a flicker of a tail, the flapping of wings, the flinching of its spines, and nothing happens. This sequence leads me to my next great bad idea. 
Only one way to know. The fog is thick enough to choke me out. Once I'm outside the sweet shop, the building immediately disappears behind me. I know it's still there, but a creeping dread is doing its best to convince me otherwise. All around me is slate gray, but somewhere there are monsters, hidden just out of sight. I start walking in the general direction because I didn't consider how the fact that I'm walking through fog might affect my ability to actually find anything. <gasps> Found you. The fog parts around me, and gradually the manticore comes into view. First the claws, then the mane, the spines, the rows of sharp teeth. Every instinct in my body tells me to run, that no one faces down a monster like this and lives. This is why we build walls. This is why the world will always be afraid of monsters. And I had to learn this the hard way. But as I wait for a roar, a claw through my heart, for the manticore to tear me apart, nothing happens. The manticore is just a monument, a living thing frozen in time. Looking around, I can see the rest of the herd in the same situation. If you're going to be like that, then let's get a good look at you. I step closer, my fears hold on me weakening with each step. I force myself to meet the manticore's eyes, my gaze first traveling over its wide, gleaming mouth. I don't have to be afraid of you. The manticore does not respond to that, much to my relief. I step around it, looking at it from all angles. Now that the initial panic of my realization has faded, my old friend Curiosity has settled in. Being from Jericho, I really haven't had that many experiences with monsters firsthand. The few that I've had have been... memorable. But let's say that Roanoke is uniquely situated. I doubt almost anyone else has had a chance like this. That wasn't a corpse, or looking down at one, that is. What? I pick my foot up to find thousands of glass shards underfoot, all over the ground. I... I could have sworn these weren't here earlier. We're in the middle of the street, and it's... totally silent. Why can't I remember if they were here? I crouch down, examining them, looking for a trail, some sort of pattern, some sort of answer. My heart stutters when I find it. A piece of glass dyed crimson with blood held up between my two fingers. The more I look, the more pieces I find, speckled, painted, even coated in it. <laughs> Everywhere I look is just a field of shattered glass, my reflection boring into me a thousand different ways until each one tells a different story. There is a boy jumping off a cliff to certain death, a woman in her wedding dress tipping backward into an otherworldly tempest, a man reviled for tall tales, pushed into the woods, a community shutting its doors, always dreading the moment they hear the desperate cries for help but know that they must refuse. A girl standing in a hole in a wall, screaming until she is breathless. A bleeding boy crushed by the foundation of a town that never wanted him, that never knew how. Flames and pyres, cages and dark depths, unexplainable early graves and shadows lurking on the walls, pitchforks, backstabbing, cruel words I never should have said, and suddenly I understand that a thousand times this mirror is held up to us, and every time we refuse the reflection, shattering it until we are all fragments of past mistakes and loves and fears, and a person cannot be more than just a broken web, because if you grab one piece too hard, you bleed, and that's when the monsters find you, and... They tear you apart for what you really always have been, lurking in the fog. So I run, knowing that each step I take only brings the monster closer. Maybe I don't have to be afraid of the monsters in the forest, or the monsters living in us all, but I am. Maybe I should give up the charade, but I know I can't. There's so much I have to do. My story doesn't end here. It, it can't. I can feel the truth burning through my mind, but I just can't remember. If only I could remember. 
I am, once again, somehow, running for my life. The sweet shop door is suddenly right in front of me. Sweet salvation that it is, I reach for the door, ripping it open, and... Thank you.